Um, my name is Alfred Herrera. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost and I direct the Center for Community College Partnerships here at UCLA. A little bit about me. Um, I've been here forever. Actually, on Friday it will be 37 years that I've been at UCLA. And for the first 18 years um, here, I worked in undergraduate admissions, working on transfer uh, recruitment and spent a great deal of time helping faculty understand how important it was to take all of these different things into consideration rather than just GPA for transfer students because there are much more uh, complex issues that they uh, come with and so forth. So after uh, Prop 209 in 1998, the vice chancellor, or the, the um, legislature gave funding for the UCs to try to increase and maintain diversity because obviously with 209 we were going to be hit hard and we as we were and so they were trying to figure out how do we continue to maintain and increase diversity in the university so each campus received some funding our campus decided to focus on community college as a way to increase diversity and I was fortunate enough to be asked by the vice uh, chancellor to come into the chancellor's office and develop a community college outreach strategy for UCLA because I had been working in admissions primarily in community with community college students for 18 years. So for two years we went around the community colleges in the local area and we talked with different uh, faculty administrators, counselors, presidents, students about the whole issue and uh, trying to figure out how we were going to develop that. And so what we did is we created this uh, program called the Center for Community College Outreach which is uh, the beautiful thing is I got to uh, create it, write it, write my own job description, and continue to do the work that I love to do for the last uh, almost 18 years now. So fast forward to now, and there's so much to say. Uh, first of all, I'm going to acknowledge David Nguyen, who is in here. Um, he's embarrassed for me to acknowledge him, but isn't this amazing, this event? <laughs> It takes a special kind of person to pull all of this together, as you know, because I do a lot of events and it's really so. My hat's off to you, even though I don't wear one, but my, uh, his hat's off to you. <laughs> um, I've heard some incredible uh, stories today uh, from people about it, so I'm happy to participate. I've already used probably four minutes of my time, so I'm going to be uh, very fast because my, my thing is I talk a lot. Um, so let me go on and talk about that. First, I want to acknowledge the people whose lands we sit on. So the original inhabitants of this land are the Gabrielino and Tongva people, and it's always important for us to recognize and understand that, so I honor them. Secondly, just a very brief thing about community colleges, although most of you probably know all of this stuff, but essentially where most of our students go, particularly first-generation, low-income students, underrepresented students, or in community colleges, we have challenges, we have had challenges, so it's really important for us to focus on how we develop our programming and so forth. 80% of African American and Latino students, half of students of color, more students of color in California, uh, CSU and USC combined are in the community college system. So it's really important for us to figure out what we do. The real challenge is that for the last umpteen years, not much has been done with community colleges only until the last 10 years, I would say, or more, a little bit more, where a lot more research has been, um, have been, has been done. So I used to say, if you want to know something about African-American students in community colleges, where are you going to find it? There wasn't much, not much at all until the work with Jay Luke and Frank Harris started and some other people five years ago, eight years ago, whatever, but for a long time, if you, heard, if you wanted to study African-American students in, in higher ed, it would be a little sentence or two inside a larger report about four-year universities. So I'm really happy now that there's a lot of that. I'm happy many of you are focusing on that because that's exactly what we need. So as we started the work here, and first I have to give credit to Dr. Dimple Jan, who is at Cal State Northridge. Um, I hired Dimple to be my graduate student researcher I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, now I don't even know, time goes like shh. Um, so when, I, uh, when Dimple started with me, I was about practice. I was about let's just do the work and let's just get it done and let's make, uh, do some incredible things and then move on. Dimple came in, I hired her, 
And she started saying, so where's the, where's the assessment? What are you guys doing about writing about this? And I'm like, I don't care about writing about it. I care about doing it. I'm a practitioner. I'm not a, a theory person. I'm not a professor. For me, it's about I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. We did assessment. We did those evaluations. But it was, it was geared towards just helping us uh, increase the programming that we did and make it even better. When Dimple came in, um, immediately she started talking to a money my other peer mentors. We have a peer mentor system that I'll describe in a minute. Um, and the, the interest in, in um, PhD and graduate work went up like 75% for the students that were our peer mentors because every day she talked about those kinds of things with them and so forth. She also then began to do some research on the work that we had done for the last 10 years or so looking at our programming, looking at the success of the students, looking at what happened with many of the students and so forth. And she created, uh, she, she um, developed a system for us to actually begin to do an evaluation of one of our programs. So as we were looking at that, we decided that we needed to come up with some kind of a model. And so I'm going to go through here first quickly. So the traditional approach um, in the discussion around transfer focuses on the student. And traditionally, it's the student's fault that they don't transfer because they're not prepared. And that's the way people have looked at it all along. And this whole deficit thinking model has been out there, continues to be out there, but it's really huge. And students are always put at the center of that as if they are the problem. And the whole idea of what I call the at-risk challenge, imagine being in a program and somebody tells you you're an at-risk student. That sure boasts your confidence. So it's a whole idea about what do we, our terminology and how we use those things to help students achieve. And looking at you know, the, whole, the whole thing about professors thinking that community college students are inferior. So you come to, to uh, a community college and then you transfer. It's because you're not smart enough to come in as a freshman. And we all know the statistics and all of that. The worst part is that it continues today even with the research that shows that transfer students do as well, if not better, graduate in the same kind of time, et cetera, et cetera. There are people, including people and professors at UCLA recently, a few years ago, the econ professor, so on and so forth. We all know about that. If you don't, look it up. But the reality is, unfortunately, it still exists. So our role is really to start looking at how do we change that discourse? How do we begin to talk about it in a different way? How do we develop research that's focused on trying to move people away from the blame the student to blame the institution, but not really blame the institution, but really try to help the institution understand what they need to do differently? So um, as we begin to look at this critical approach, looking at how do, you, uh, how do you account for the historical tracking? So when you're in, in, in middle school, when you're in high school, and they put you here, and you're not supposed to be there, you're an English language learner, and you get here because you are supposedly are not smart enough, and basically it's a language issue. All of the kinds of things that we need to start looking at is how we begin to look at our critical approach in community college. The other thing that was always uh, interesting to me is why are we always blaming community college student, uh, colleges for not transferring students? So what role does a four-year university play in that? And nobody ever was talking about that. And one of the things that some of my colleagues, when I was in recruitment and admissions, when I used to say to them, you know, first of all, UCLA is a huge place. And it's a place where if you say the name, a lot of people want to go. And a lot of people are going to come and visit you and so forth. Some of the other campuses that are smaller don't have that luxury, and they have to work to get students. So when they go to a transfer center at a community college, and they tell the transfer center by phone, I'm going to be there. Let's set up the visit next week. Then they show up, and one or two students is there. They blame the community college for not doing the work. And I always used to ask them, what did you do? What have you done to ensure that students know you're coming? What media, what public relations, what anything have you done to ensure that? So it was always, the onus was always on community colleges as we do that. So we started looking at that and started thinking that we're trying to figure out how do we change this discussion so that we take responsibility. So community colleges are blaming high school. Four-year universities are blaming community college. <laughs> and it's a vicious cycle, right? So we began to look at, well, then whose responsibility is it if no one takes ownership? And so we, de we decided it's everybody's. It is a, a joint effort from all systems and all institutions to look at this 
collectively to figure out how you do that. So we began to do some research and we began to look at what was out there and begin to talk to people. Well, maybe I won't change this. And uh, it's stuck. One second. And so we began to look at some of the work around uh, uh, academic culture and looking at Pat McDonough's work on college-going culture and looking at uh, Armida Ornelas' work from East LA College on transfer-sending culture. Fortunately, I had worked with, with Armida on, this, on her uh, graduate work while I was in admissions. And so when we started looking at that, we began to think about, OK, so we should take ownership of some of the challenge. And we should begin to look at a transfer receptive culture and looking at how can we make this university or any four-year university more receptive to students, more welcoming for students. What do we need to do that? So we came up with um, what we call our transfer receptive culture. I'm sure many of you have already seen it. I just heard from a couple people that say they use it. But essentially, it's a responsibility for the university to take ownership and to take some responsibility for making sure that they look at all of the different programming on their campus, services, counseling, and so on, to determine how students feel more welcome to come here, right? Um, comparing it to the transfer sending and transfer re uh, receptive, very similar things. Looking at institutional priority, looking at support, looking at family, looking at all those things, and the interse intersection between the two, which is really critical to make sure so one of the things that we began to do when we started this is talk to faculty. And we found out faculty from community colleges don't talk to faculty from four-year. Wow, what a novel idea, right? I, I, teach, I teach English freshman comp at East LA College, and you teach English at UCLA freshman comp. And we don't even know what you're requiring. You don't even know what we're requiring. So how am I supposed to prepare students to go to your class above these if I don't know what your, t what your expectations are. So we started looking at that and some interesting conversations came up. But essentially, we looked at this and tried to figure out how do we play a role in, in that. As I said, the genealogy kind of went through that already, the effective schools framework, college going, transfer sen sending, and transfer receptive. So we came up with, to be honest, 25 elements to be a transfer receptive culture. And we laughed because we thought, how are you ever going to do that? We nailed it down to five. It took us months and months and months of arguing, discussion, sleeping, non-sleeping, to try to figure out what this thing of, called transfer receptive would be. So we began, we thought, well, we sh it really begins before the students transfer and continues when, they, when they're after. So these are the five that we narrowed it down to. This was in 2011 when we wrote our first uh, article about this, introducing that. We have since written four or five articles, and we are now working on additional ones. Additionally, we just finished a book on transfer receptive culture, and hopefully, this is a shameless plug, um, <laughs> hopefully it'll be out sometime next year. We're doing the final edits and so forth. Um, and I'm not a writer, and I'll never do it again. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. Institutional priority. We began to say that if you really want to transfer and you want to welcome students, you need to make sure that the leadership is there. Very quick comment. UCLA uh, Chancellor started eight years ago. I met with him this, the second week he was on campus. He asked to hear about our different outreach uh, programs. So I met with him. I did a presentation about our work. He said, and first time ever, administrator taking all kinds of notes. And I was doing my presentation thinking, He's either taking great notes or he's writing a to-do list of what he needs to do, right? Because I've never seen anybody in administration write lots of notes and so on and so forth. Usually they're just kind of like, yeah, 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 right? Anyway, after the presentation, he came over and he, or he said, um, I really want to help. How can I help? And of course, I'd already planned for that. So I said, well, if you really want to do that, I want to take you to community colleges because they need to see you. You need to be a presence on their campus. And um, so we did. He said, well, let's just do you know, a couple hours. We did half day visits. We saw everybody there. We did presentations. We did meetings with faculty, staff, students, administrators. We have done seven, uh, 16 visits uh, in the last eight years that he's been here. That to me is an institutional commitment because he, he's committed to making sure that people know we want transfer students and so forth. 
So after about halfway through, he asked me if um, I thought they were making a difference. We were driving. I was driving him to our net, one of our visits. And I said, well, Chancellor, let me be very blunt with you. And he says, well, haven't you always been? And I'm like, well, yeah. But I said, your visit alone, <laughs> your visit alone is not going to change those numbers. And he says, what do you mean? Isn't, it, aren't we, you know, isn't that what we're about? I said, yeah, but just you showing up one day forever, and then that is not going to do it. That's great, but we need money, we need support, we need programming, et cetera. So we were able to get additional, uh, the additional support for that. Outreach programs, don't you love the, pre the publications that show 18-year-old you know, kids and you've got a black student, a brown student, a Latino, I mean, a, you know, Asian, and it's just the perfect diversity, no disabled students, no older students, and all of that. And so what they do, they take the, the freshman uh, pro, uh, publications and they put, change the names and then they put them out there. So we began to look at what is out there for non-traditional students specifically, veterans, parenting students, and so forth. And so that's the other piece. The third piece is post-transfer, financial aid. They come with very different kinds of experiences, with different kinds of debt, with different kinds of responsibility. So packaging students differently is really important. And then the support, non-traditional, transfer center, and so on and so forth. And I'm running through this now because I have a little bit of time. Community and family support, making sure that the lived experiences of our students are appreciated. Tell you a quick story. Transfer student came here, and she was in a class, and they were talking about the, uh, I call it the uprisings. They called it the riots, the Rodney King riots, right? Uprising, she's in a class, there's a, a professor who's younger than she is, she's like 55 years old, and he starts talking about it and she raises her hand and says, can I provide the lived experience? I was there, I lived three blocks from all of that. And all that, and he says, I'm sorry, we don't have the time. So that's the kind of thing when we say the lived experiences of students is critical to make sure that we honor and, uh, and use those, and that's not done. Research and assessment, yeah, that's the piece that we need to do and keep doing and keep doing, and we are, and we are, and we are. <laughs> Developing transfer spaces, this is UCLA, CCP, my program, AAP, different student orgs, transfer center, CPO. So making sure, the problem is, this should be filled with things. It shouldn't be five places on a campus that are, that are receptive to transfer students, it should be the entire campus. And that's where we're moving for, I tell you, 10, 15 years ago, UCLA hated transfer students. Well, more than they did. Um, CCCP, our mission, you can look it up. Some of you may already know about it. Essentially, we're trying to help students become competitive for the university. Not UCLA, our role is UC. Because so many of our students are pushed into CSU that we want to provide them an opportunity. I'm a two-time graduate of CSU. They're amazing institutions. But what we want is to give them options. So we teach them about transfer so they are better informed and make a better uh, informed decision. Uh, we have a peer mentoring. I have uh, one student at every community college in LA uh, County. There are 21 community colleges. I've got one student there for at least five to seven hours a week talking about transfer and why it's important. East LA College, I have 13 students. Uh, LA Pierce, I have 11. Uh, Valley, I have five, seven because we have an intensive partnership with those schools. Pasadena next year, we're going to have um, about seven more. So it's about presence. It's about the opportunity. It's about the story. It's about visibility. We do Saturday academies, programs, the outcome. About 60% of the students who come through our program get admitted to UCLA who apply. The, average, the admit rate for UCLA for transfer students in general is 24% this year. So this year we had about a 62%. So we really try to help students, and I work very closely with the admissions office. Having trained many of the people there, um, it's great. These are the programs we do. We, we use critical race theory as the foundation of that. Danny uh, Solorsono is our hero, as is everyone's. We work with uh, Tara Yoso's um, work as well on, on community cultural wealth. Last, faculty mentors are essential. You know, one thing I've always said for 20 years is imagine a student walking in to a classroom and, this, and the professor says, so where are you going to transfer? Can you imagine if a student heard that every, every, every day, it would, make, it would mean something? Support begins in the classroom. I have zero minutes, but I'm going to just run through these. Presence by university. We need to be there. My counselors say, how could we get students interested if you don't come? So we need to be, the presence is important. Support programs, EOPS, Mess Up, Went There. All of those programs are in critical. 
Peer mentoring is important. Show me how to do it because you just did it. You just transferred from there. So that's really important. Cohort programs matter. Most of us don't know anything about why we should study in a group. Most of it's I'm embarrassed because, you know, all that. Implications, we need to shift the gaze. From two to four year, we need to do all of those things. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry.